apologize, to take a bill up. And the choice was to start the hearing, recess the hearing, to go take a bill up, or to do the bill and start to keep a hearing all the way through until we made that the latter decision. So I, I want to thank you for your uh, <coughs> the Senate Committee on Food and Agriculture. Uh, today's topic is evaluating the need for the California Department of Food and Agriculture's white brown apple moth eradication program. And it's a review of the Alabama Environmental Impact Report. And I would like to thank all of you for coming today. I know some folks traveled some significant distance to be here. Uh, I'd also uh, like to thank the department uh, as well for being here. We have uh, some questions on the sufficiency of the environmental impact report uh, that we brought at our last previous hearing on this topic. And as I remember it, now that we have a final EIR, we're here to find out a little bit more about the findings, uh, about the report, and CDFA's future plans for their LBAP program. Uh, overall, the goal today is to evaluate the need for CDFA, CDFA's light app, brown apple moth eradication program in its entirety. And uh, obviously, the committee today has jurisdiction over CDFA, and we have, uh, of course, been awaiting the final EIR product, and, and we will have some related policy questions on that product. I can tell you that uh, it seems to me uh, that this committee would not lean towards uh, any sort of program that would cause human harm or environmental damage. This uh, is Hank Committee. We're very concerned about these issues. And uh, I do want to make sure the department on the record uh, to explain and to talk to us about the evaluating factors that were considered in this particular EIR. Uh, it's a goal, obviously, obviously for this committee uh, to be as open and transparent as possible. And we believe that should hold true for the EIR process itself. Um, obviously, we're going to hear from farmers and constituents who are affected by some of these decisions by CDFA. We'd like to learn more about the impact of these decisions based on the EIR, not only to business operations, but to the economy as a whole. Um, clearly, I can tell you that we will continue to monitor uh, CDFA's activities as they relate to the outcome program. Uh, we will not, of course, hesitate to have future hearings uh, on this issue in order to get uh, final actions regarding the EIRs. This won't be the last hearing we have on this, I'm sure. And of course, we're interested in public comment today, so we would like to make public comment for the record. We'd be very interested in making sure we have that as well. So that being said, uh, we have a revised agenda. I hope everyone got that. We have four panels today, and we're going to start with James Carey, who's professor at the University of California Davis, and uh, Aaron Warren, who is now a power grower. So if both of you can come up, and we can begin the process. Thank you uh, for inviting us. Aaron actually is going to start. Sure, that's fine. Then you say your name for the record. Um, as I said, we're building a public record. Okay. Um, my name is Aaron Warren. I'm, I'm with the GP LLC. We're avocado farmers. I've been in the family business since 1968. Um, just to let you know that um, I, I have a few things regarding the med line. We're currently under quarantine right now. We're finishing up. It's been about four to five months since we've been under quarantine. And when CDFA notified us that we had to come to the meeting, they, they basically sat us at the Palo Mesa Resort um, hotel in Milwaukee, the area, and they basically had a guy there, I forget his name, but he was for the San Diego County Regional Area, and um, in their offices are in uh, San Marcos, and he, bas basically all the farmers came in, and they were really pleased about this, and so he just stood up and said, well, this is this problem happens to be on your end of the end of, end of woods, and said that you need to, you're going to have to buy the um, the melphion for uh, regular people, and um, and the uh, spinoza for the organic growers, and unfortunately the cost that I have here 
um, with the treatment of the Malathion for four, five applications equals sixty dollars an acre. Six applications equals seventy-two dollars an acre. Seven applications equals eighty-four dollars an acre. So um, what they told us it would be about eight hundred dollars a gallon. They also told us that they're going to have we're going to have to set up an appointment with one of the inspections and the inspector comes out and he will watch the farmer or the person who's um, licensed for the for the um, pesticides stir, stir it up but if you pre-stir it before they hit your property you're going to have to dump it and you're going to have to dump it and then it goes into the water which goes into into um, reservoirs and all other sorts of things. We don't even know where it goes. And also they, they told us this this is all on you. You gotta afford it. And we were basically just railroaded. I felt we were railroaded. I didn't feel that we had a fair shake in this. Um, I was 500 meters away from the hot zone. The hot zone is where they detect the fly. I have maps, I have things with me that I brought. I will tell you that it was just heartbreaking to see some a person from the government to treat us like that. We're farmer growers. We're not we're people to supply food for our local areas and for our county. We want to stay in business. We don't want to be railroaded. Also, they, they gave us an option on buying insurance, insurance, quarantine insurance. So, so what my, my, my coworker did, she called our, our rural, rural <coughs> community insurance um, agency and talked about the, the quarantine insurance. And unfortunately, the insurance that I have was quoted in 2007 at, um, 50% at CAT, I, the level is 50%, it's avocado, it's irrigated, and <coughs> the acres is $270, 270 acres. The, the price per acre is $1,832, and the base premium is $43,939. If we went up to 60% at 270 acres, the base premium for that is $147,273. And that is just buying the buyout program. The buyout <coughs> program. The buyout program is, is basically one step to getting to the, to the um, quarantine insurance. And you can't qualify if you're not detected with that fly. And if you're not detected with the fly, you, you, you're out. You're sorry, Senator. And I already pay um, for, for my insurance, just for crop <coughs> insurance itself, is $300 a year. And we get, in case we get, um, in, in case natural, natural dis, dis, um, disaster happens, like a fire or flooding or other things that happen, we have to go through that, and the U.S. government also um, gives us a refund. Uh, no. The U.S. government um, gives us the base premium of thirty-nine thousand. Oh, yeah, this is from the United States government, thirty-nine thousand four four hundred seventy-four dollars, and that's what they're going to reimburse you if you you had damages to just fire or rep damage or. You know, just minor, minor, like major catastrophe, but nothing like on this magnitude where we're getting quarantined. It's just I feel that this is really hard for us to figure out where we go or how can we afford this when we've got water issues. We have to we have to supply for fertilizer and feed and 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 just all of that. It, it's just a catastrophe for us. Um, my, my growth manager has been in the organic business for 34 years and he says that if we continue on this path I'm going to be out of business in less than three or four years 
and he just feels for him. And he's even spoken to growers that just are shaking their heads, going, wondering what happened. Why are they coming down so hard on us? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Senator Ford, for inviting me to testify. Because this hearing is concerned with approaches for dealing with exotic pests, because I know a great deal about the medfly, and because Aaron Warren, who just testified before me, uh, uh, has issues dealing with the, with the medfly, um, uh, my testimony is framed around this pest. However, I believe that virtually all the concerns I've raised on the medfly can also be raised on other pests, including Elbat. Now, I would venture to say that the farmer we just heard, Aaron uh, Morin, is the only person in this room who faces not just economic hardship from the medfly and LBAM. Uh, she didn't mention, by the way, that she might be subject to LBAM uh, quarantine as well. But the real possibility of economic devastation, that is losing her entire farm and thus her means of livelihood. Uh, last week, Last week, I, uh, when I was going, uh, heard that she was going to testify at this hearing, I got contact information uh, since I was interested in what she would say about the medfly. I'm talking to her on the phone. On the phone, I learned that she was flying here on her own money, but no one was meeting her at the airport. She was going to stay with somebody she met on Facebook. She stayed last night with my wife and myself, and I learned the magnitude of this devastation she and her family faces. What she did laid out was really beyond belief. It's like a bolt of blue. Two medflies are captured near her avocado farm and her life is turned upside down. There's no economic options, no legal appeals. This is absolute tragedy for the farmers and there appears to be no one who is concerned with their plight. Indeed, there appears to be either a uh, disconnect between the claims by CDFA on the impact of the growers and the reality uh, to the pr uh, problems on farmers. Just this morning when I was preparing for this testimony, I went to the web and the CDFA has posted the medfly uh, interior quarantine. They state, no business, has gone, no business has gone out of business due to medfly quarantine. That's not a very high bar, but I'd like to know what the data is for that. And also, it would be interesting to know how many people like Aaron had to take out new loans and degree economic hardship and so forth. Other statements, many businesses have benefited from sales of safeguarded material. Uh, regarding vendors, these businesses may experience a reduction in sales and reduced shelf life, but neither of these reductions would represent a significant economic impact. I have to believe that th there's a real disconnect here and that the farmers and vendors and so forth are really suffering. So I would say at the very least from this hearing, the CDFA and USDA would be encouraged to talk to the farmers and get this directly. Now, regarding the uh, this, uh, exotic pests more generally, uh, I have uh, problem with many of the policies and programs for the invasive pests because I believe that they're as outdated as they are uh, scientific. You can even take, for example, the trigger, the tube medfly trigger that caused Aaron's farm to be quarantined. I served on the medfly panel from 87 to 94 and I know that there's no scientific basis for these. It's just sort of consensus. You've got to uh, 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 have these policies. That would be an example. Another would be the acreage under quarantine and so forth. This is just an assertion. It's just a uh, sort of consensus among panelists, but there's not a scientific basis for this. That would be just one example. Now, with respect to the medfly situation, that I also think is uh, generic to many other pests, I believe that the medfly is permanently established in the state. There's probably many other fruit flies as well. There's five cities just where Aaron is in San Diego County, Escondido, Fallbrook, Oceanside, Spring Valley, and Imperial Beach. They've caught medflies over a series of years there. One out of three cities uh, in the state, that is 167 different cities of had medfly appearances. There's 47 of these cities in, uh, with multiple appearances. In fact, one with 11 different uh, years in which they caught the medfly, two cities in five to six different years. The medfly was discovered just down the road here in Dixon in 07. Uh, raising the disturbing possibility that spread to the agricultural regions of the state. Uh, there's been 60 emergency medfly projects and thus 60 eradication declarations. That is successful uh, uh, declarations in the last, uh, uh, including 17 in the last 10 years. Uh, there's 300 square miles under quarantine, including Aaron, Aaron's uh, uh, farm. Now, what I'd like to do is uh, ask that CDFA and the USDA ans uh, answer in writing uh, through you, Senator Flores, a uh, series of questions. I won't go through all of those, but if the claim is that these medflies are being reintroduced into the state, then in fact this does not resonate when you answer these questions. 
Why, for example, why did the Medline never appear in the state before 1975, and since then has appeared, appeared in two out of three years, and more recently virtually every year? Another example, why are there no Medfly outbreaks in other high-risk but Medfly-friendly states, such as Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico? They too have international airports, vacationers from Hawaii, and migrant workers. There's a series of questions like this. It does, simply does not uh, make sense that you'd only find these in California. This is 100% of all Medfly outbreaks are in California. This is worldwide, not just in the country. Now, I believe what to be done more generally about the exotic pest I believe that the, we need a complete overhaul of the exotic pest paradigm. It simply cannot be changed by fine-tuning or tweaking. I believe we need something like a congressional hearing, including with the Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, this is, uh, I also believe that uh, we need involvement of the National Academy of Sciences. You bring the best possible science to bear on this and the most elite scientists become involved. Uh, the, uh, for example, when we talk about paradigm shift, I think every uh, sort of domain within, within this uh, area needs to be revisited. From the farmer, I believe it needs to be in control. They need to be in control of their own destiny. You can have a consortium of farmers. It needs to be more in their hands than just in the state's hands, tapping into these emergency funds. The quarantine, we've got to work with farmers so that the local concerns are taken into consideration with, uh, in concert with the more global concerns. Right now, Erin is just thrown under the bus, she was saying last night. Intervention, there's new tools. Where's the molecular biology here? There's, there's just spectacular science available, and they're not being brought, this is not being brought to bear on these exotic pests. Monitoring, you should be able to, what they call barcode a fly, within 24 or 48 hours and know where that fly came from. Not just in Hawaii, but in fact, where in Hawaii, Guatemala, and so forth. Exclusion, trade, all these things need revisiting. I'll end here with a, a projection. I did a really rough regression here, and uh, what's uh, the, the trend here in terms of emergency projects is about one new emergency project every two years, but there's huge variation. And uh, this variation from 5 to 17 over the past 15 years or so. So in 10 years, that means we'd have 16 uh, on average uh, emergency projects on exotic pests with an upper limit of maybe 22. In 20 years, we have 21, upper limit of 30. 30 years, we have up to 35 or so. In other words, it's conceivable at some point in the not too distant future, we may have five or 10 or even 20% of all farms in the state under some sort of quarantine, just like with uh, Aaron's farm. Clearly, we cannot move forward with business as usual with exotic pests. It's not just a matter of doing this a little better. We've got to change the whole framework of how we uh, approach this. Thank you uh, for inviting me. <clears throat> Chairman Flores, Vice Chairman Obama, and esteemed members of the Senate Committee on Food and Agriculture, thank you for taking the time to hear testimony today about the light brown apple moth and the implications of the quarantine program. My name is Chris Middlestad, and I am the founder and CEO of The Fruit Guys. I founded The Fruit Guys in 1998 as a way to deliver fresh fruit to offices to replace junk food and help employees eat healthy while at work. We're a privately held family business that remains active not only in the business community, but also through, also through service work that includes donations of food to those in need, farm stewardship projects around sustainability, volunteering for organizations such as the California Task Force on Youth and Workplace Wellness, and Shape Up San Francisco. As a Bay Area-based business, we are advocates for locally grown produce and have followed that philosophy throughout our expansion by opening up local operations in places such as Philadelphia and Chicago so that we can buy from farmers in the region by season. Because we buy directly from many small and organic farmers in California, I have been given a few a view into the impacts of the light brown apple moth quarantine that I would like to share with you today. I draw two main conclusions from observing and talking with the small farmers that we work with. The first, as you will hear, is that it is truly the quarantine and not the moth that is most damaging to small California farmers. The second, as I will explain, is that the light brown apple moth quarantine is inadvertently creating international trade policy that benefits international farmers importing product from countries that do not quarantine for the light brown apple moth over our own local California growers who are having to exist under the terms of this quarantine. Blue Moon Organics, a small organic farm in Aptos, California, is a provider to the fruit guys of fresh organic strawberries. Greg Rawlings and his wife Amy are the owners, and we've worked with them for a number of years. Greg is one of the farmers we work with who has been quarantined. Greg sells nearly all he grows locally within 150 miles of Aptos. His first quarantine for light brown apple moth came in late June and early July of 2009. 
State officials found 20 suspected light brown apple moth larvae on three and a half acres of a seven acre strawberry patch. At the time, they told Greg that they would get back to him within seven to 10 days. His, his product and that three and a half acres of land was under quarantine for three and a half weeks before officials got back to him with an answer that it was not the light brown apple moth, but a native leaf roller in his field. Strawberries are, of course, fragile and need to go to market immediately, especially organically grown ones. Thus, during the first quarantine period, Greg not only lost his crop, but also had to pay pickers to remove the berries as they came in during this time so that they would not fester and ruin his future crops. The payment to workers plus the lost revenue was significant. However, this was not the end of his story. As the first quarantine ended, inspectors again came out and now inspected the other three and a half acres of his strawberry patch. This was toward the end of July in 2009. In this section, they found 110 larvae and again quarantined Greg and said that they would get back to him within seven to 10 days. Greg asked them why they would assume that these larvae were any different from the others found just a few rows over and thus why they would quarantine him when they had just proven that he had had a native non elban leaf roller on his property. Greg did not get a sufficient answer. 25 days later, now into August and now past Greg's June and July prime strawberry growing season, CDFA reported to Greg that again, all 110 larvae were in fact native leaf rollers and thus negative for Elbion. When Greg, exasperated, asked how he could avoid quarantine in the future, the answer he was given was that he needed to eradicate all caterpillars on his strawberries to be assured that he would not be quarantined. He was told otherwise, if they find anything, they will suspect Elbion and immediately quarantine. Greg asked since they had found native leaf rollers previously, would this count to any documentation of not having found Elbound and thus alleviate quarantine threat? Again, they said no. As a sustainable and organic farmer, the kind we like to work with, Greg finds value in caterpillars as they provide food for spiders, which are a benefit to Greg and his growing practices. In total, in the summer of 2009, Greg lost nearly $40,000 in revenue and had to pay his workers to pick crop that was thrown away. He is still trying to recover from a year that includes this unexpected economic damage suffered from quarantine that wasted his time and money, as well as the taxpayers' dollars, for a moth that, according to Greg and other farmers we work with, as well as scientists both here and abroad, this is not a threat to a farmer's crop whatsoever. Greg's story is not unique, but it is a good example of how we are hurting our local growers. I would now like to address how this policy not just hurts these local farmers, but also potentially benefits foreign farmers and creates a damaging and unfair trade imbalance. As an example, I would like you to think about two apple orchards, exactly the same. One, both of them with light brown apple moth in, in them, in equal amounts. One farmer was given a path, pass from the light brown apple moth quarantine and allowed to sell apples to the grocery store. Another was restricted from sale due to the quarantine. This would seem like a clear case of a policy applied arbitrarily and subjectively that benefited one farmer over another without any legal basis for doing so. What could possibly be the difference between these two farms? In this case, an example that I'm giving you, one is in New Zealand and the other is in California. This is exactly what is happening in our relationship with New Zealand farmers who are importing, importing fruit into California. In New Zealand, light brown apple moth is prevalent and farmers are not quarantined product can come into this country and state and be sold in our grocery stores. However, our domestic growers, our local growers, our organic growers who have the most dedication and appreciation for keeping California land healthy and productive are being restricted from selling their product and earning a living by those entities that are supposed to look after their interests of California farmers. I would imagine as a goal, CDFA would at least want to make sure that there's a level playing field for all which currently as a result of this policy in regards to domestic and international trade status, there is not. I know that this is a complex and contentious issue, and I appreciate your openness to hearing my arguments against the quarantine and why it is bad from a business perspective for California and for our farmers. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak this afternoon. My name is Andrew Paul Gutierrez. I'm a professor at UC Berkeley. I'm now emeritus. And my area of expertise is what I call agroecosystems analysis. It's applying engineering sorts of um, approaches to the analysis of pests and uh, plant growth problems. I was a founder of the University of California IPM program back in 1976. I've been working on LBAM when I realized that uh, they were trying to spend $100 million to eradicate it. So 
So I started doing an analysis on it. And the analysis puts together the biology of um, the species, drives it with weather, you embed the model into a GIS um, program, and then you can map the potential distribution and abundance of that species. And the results that came out were absolutely astonishing. It said that this species would be limited primarily to the coast, that there would be some intrusion into the shadow of the, the, of the winds coming in from the San Francisco Bay in toward Sacramento Valley. And when you look on the ground, uh, light brown apple moth is a very difficult species to find. It's not very common. And if it is such an important pest, why is it so difficult to find? Well, I tried uh, giving this information to California Department of Food and Agriculture sent a letter to Secretary Palomar, addressed a conference in Foster City uh, on Felbam, and by and large, the information was ignored. The CDFA's uh, approach has been is to accept a USDA analysis, which posits that most of California would be infested by uh, light brown apple moth, and the southern half of the United States. Uh, to be polite, this um, analysis is at best bogus. It is not very good at all. CDFA claims that uh, the, the hallmark of their eradication success is pink bollworm. When you do exactly the same analysis for pink bollworm, it says that mostly pink bollworm could exist in the Central Valley of California. So what do they eradicate? They have eliminated a pest, supposedly, because they can't find it. But if you think about it, what's happened is that the introduction of BT cotton, which is highly effective against pink bollworm in the desert valleys, reduces the populations to very low numbers. So these anticyclonic winds that would normally bring the pest over the tachypes during late summer brings very, very few to non-detectable levels. I've done a similar analysis on medfly. And the predictions for medfly are basically that it's Southern California, San Diego, Orange County, Los Angeles Basin, and a bit of Santa Barbara. On an annual basis, you might get patches of favorability elsewhere, but for something to be established, it must have continuous life cycles. Done the same thing for glass ceiling sharpshooter or Pierce's disease. And I'm now doing um, the um, great berry moth, which has been reported from Napa uh, County. All of this work was done without any funding from within the state of California. It comes mostly by working with European colleagues. Why? Because it's difficult to get funding from CDFA unless you're doing things that would tend to enhance how the bureaucracy is operating. CDFA has basically refused to listen to science or at least have a discussion, an argument about the soundness of the science. And that does not bode well for the future when, as uh, uh, Jim Carrey said, we're going to have an abundance of new invasive species coming in. So my recommendation would be the following. The biology of species are not idiosyncratic. If you understand the biology and you can describe it in a simulation model, a mathematical model, and you can drive it with weather, then you can start uh, predicting the kind of performance that it's going to be having in a particular area, and you can start mapping of where it can be most destructive. In the state of California, this does not exist. This was the original goal of UCIPM to develop systems models for all the major crops in California. It failed because as soon as the monies became permanent, it became a mini grants program and we never got there. So my recommendation would be is that we start getting back to science and not to politics and not the bureaucracy that drives um, a funding request. 
stay within the state of California. Thank you. Well, Chairman uh, and members of the board, thank you for having me here today and putting me on the board. I don't want to spend a lot of time saying the same things that were said in the last few minutes between uh, uh, James Carey and, and Aaron and, and Paul, Dr. Paul Gutierrez, uh, as well as Chris. As I would say exactly the same thing vehemently and repeatedly, and I, I'm in total support of what they've said here in the commentary. I, I want to bring up something that probably won't be spoken about today, and that is the uh, general culture of the farmer in the complex. And, and you don't see a lot of farmers here today. Um, and I would say that's the big reason I was asked to speak is because their voices aren't being heard. Uh, there is a culture of fear, um, and these, these farmers are identified to, uh, to show their, their faces and their voices in front of a forum which will be critical of them for measuring what they say. Um, I participate at Organic Pastures Dairy, I'm the founder of Organic Pastures Dairy in Fresno, selling our organic uh, products, I have almonds and various different things, raw dairy products, so on and so forth, throughout farmers markets in California. And we repeatedly hear from other farmers, uh, uh, pear growers, apple growers, strawberry growers, that these kinds of actions are done as, um, uh, in, 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 they're not included in the process, and they're fearful to speak up in opposition to the process or in contribution to a, perhaps a better remedy in the process. And I would just repeat that uh, I completely support what's been said before. However, I want to re put an additional um, tangent to this discussion that is the fear factor of the farmers not uh, being encouraged to be a full partner in the discussion because they're just scared to death. And uh, the organic uh, farmers are very fearful because of their certifications and, and uh, their inability to go to a farmer's market where they be under quarantine or the required uh, pesticides or, or inhibition or, or suppression uh, measures that they're being asked to do. So I would just add uh, the other tangent to this is that the fear from the farmer uh, being scared to participate in the process. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I think all of you, let me just, uh, just for this panel, use some words uh, that I've kind of written down, fear, politics, um, the, the issue of whether or not this study is actually valid is the bottom line from your, all of your perspective that this is something that we're never going to eradicate anyway? I'd like to hear just your opinion. Uh, I don't think so, and I think. Uh, I don't think so, and I think that Jim Carrey is on record as having said the same thing. He's probably been here for quite some time. Populations are low. They're being controlled mostly by natural enemies. So they're just going to become part of the background. They feed on all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I'd also add too that the farmers that we work with, I think the again talking about the culture of farmers, that they would like to handle these things to some degree on their own and, and make decisions, especially the organic ones, about their organic farms uh, autonomously about how they're going to handle their their pest programs. And the ones we talk about when we brought up, we did a survey of 20 farmers in Northern California we work with to get this data about who's been affected by the apple moth. And they laughed when we said the apple moth because they said, gosh, that's so far down on the totem pole of things that we worry about that that's just not something that is, that is even considered dangerous to a farm. If I could just add one more thing. Uh, the world's an immune system and it lives and breathes. And as we create opportunities and voids uh, where we get rid of the, bio, uh, the biodiversity, we start inviting things to occupy our space that uh, could be a, you know, could be a problem, could be a pathogen for us. That goes for anything. Inside of a creamery environment, a pasture, your gut, uh, you know, in environments where we're worried about invasive uh, uh, exotic species. We have an immune system microscopically, the whole entire world. We have them also in our backyard, and in our children's uh, guts. Uh, we are one huge immune system. We have to work with Mother Nature or else we're going to be tangling with her forever. So it's very important to work with her. Uh, the other thing is that you have to look at um, these species almost one by one. I mean, they, they have different potential. So for example, the, the recently discovered uh, European grape berry moth. When you look at the parameters of that one, that one gives cause for concern. And that's something that money could be better addressed in terms of how to deal with that. And yet I don't think that anybody, to my knowledge, is, is approaching that one yet. And it's a dependent group on the trade policy you mentioned earlier in terms of uh, Canada, Mexico, other countries, Europe. What would you, what would you tell me? I'm sorry, I'm not, what would you tell me about those other countries and, and the, their dealings with Alabama? 
You know, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I've, I've really looked at the New Zealand issue because New Zealand, I think, is so akin to California in terms of having the light apple moth, having it established for a long period of time. And again, I th the concern we have there that I don't think really has been addressed, at least uh, in a sort of publicly in the media and, and just out of discussion, is that there is this sort of um, accidental consequence of this policy that is creating an international trade issue that, that needs to be discussed and talked about. And I think um, it's a very important one because when I think domestic California farmers realize it and understand that, um, it, it, it's going to cause challenges. Okay, I want to uh, thank the panel. And Mr. McAbee, you mentioned the, the, the cycle within the body. Can you just go a little further than that? And it's, uh, it's, it's one of my favorite subjects. Um, no, it's, so maybe, yeah, maybe we can get on the record. That's the well, Dean, I appreciate the invitation to discuss this briefly. Uh, the, the, probably the, 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 the most dangerous thing we can do in America as, as a living, breathing organism is to walk around with a weakened immune system. We've created challenges in our capillary dairy systems and pigs and chickens. If you've seen Food Inc., you know that we're creating superbugs with antibiotic abuse. And now they're killing tens of thousands of Americans every year because of the, the fact we've got superbugs, the MRSRAs and the VRAs and all the other Klebsiellas and everything. And when you have a, a depressed immune system in the human organism, that's a welcome map for the superbugs to come get you. So we have, we have to be thinking about how we manage our ecosystems externally in terms of not creating superbugs and monocultures, but rather polycultures and diversity that are strong, and yet at the same time building our inner ecosystems and our bodies so that we are not subject to them or any other pathogen out there as a welcome mat. So that's why we always talk about raw milk because of the biodiversity, but it's also other whole foods that are unprocessed and whole that help us keep that strong inner immune system. That's why you see this whole food movement going on and people saying prevention, prevention, immune system, immune system, because it's not talked about. Uh, but that's just a little pitch that I thought I'd throw in. Thank you for asking. Well, I can sure. And, and if we wanted to get more information on this, we can go to your booth uh, out on the, um, in the uh, CDFA Ag Day. Unfortunately, we're not there today. We were uh, not uh, allowed to present our booth. Hopefully, maybe next year we will. But uh, I've been politically correct and shaking everybody's hands today, and hopefully we'll be invited. But I think it's important to have everybody at the table because uh, some of the best markets we have are the niche markets, and they need to be addressed as well. Thank you very much for your, your time. Thank you, Mr. Matthew. Thank you for putting that latter part on the record as well. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.